Daryl going to Mackie. Yo, look, Mackie, this should go like this. That's the baseline. If I rule the world. Welcome to If I Rule the World podcast number 16. And we have on the line our, uh, our brother here, Israel Joseph from uh, Fireburn. Greetings. Greetings to the whole earth in the name of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie, I, King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, conquering the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Keeper of the Ark of the Covenant, and the Savior of Humanity during the World Wars in the 20th century. I greet you in peace, love, punk rock, soul, hardcore, all of it. Blessings. Israel, that was the best hello <laughs> we've gotten on this podcast so far. <laughs> yeah, right on. <laughs> you really jumped into it. Where Where are you calling from right now? Uh, Los Angeles. I'm out here in L.A. on the uh, far west side of the, the nation, out here by the beach um, near Venice. Near Venice. Venice All right. Beach. And now, let me ask you a question. Most of what we do over here on this podcast is based in a lot of artists that are, are in um, New York and, and specifically Long Island. And, and for some reason, when I'm remembering back to those days that you were in Bad Brains, I feel like I remember, what, were you from New York? Did you live in New York or something, Long Island? Yeah, yeah. My family, we moved to, uh, my, you know, New York in uh, probably 79, uh, I was about eight years old, we moved from the Caribbean, and uh, I grew up in uh, what, what, uh, Westbury, Long Island, actually. Oh, oh really? Man. Nice. Nice. So did yeah, uh, I grew up in Bill Westbury, Riley. so I hung out all in Carl Place and Roosevelt Field Mall and you know, oh, all okay. in places there. <laughs> Old Country Road was my, you know, that's the main strip through it, so everything that can be found on Old Country Road and beyond, you know, so um, I grew up out there, man, and... Um, yeah, in Westbury. Yeah, yeah. I I feel like I remember that as a thing being like, no, this guy Israel, he's from Long Island, he's from New York, and um, yeah, yeah, so the W L I R. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we what we want to do here with you. There's you know the things about you that I know are these two great bright spots. It's um, Bad Brains in the Rise era and this great new band that you have, Fire Burn. But for some reason, I just feel like. I don't know that much about you. And even like in researching you, I was like, I want to know these things. And I, I really want to kind of know your history. And my assumption would be Bad Brains was not your first band. So if you could take us back mm -hmm. a little bit to back then, how you got into punk rock and your first bands. Okay. So um, growing up in New York, I was, uh, you know, moved, I moved from the Caribbean. So... Okay. Um, I was uh, kind of uh, an outsider in that sense to begin with, right? Right. And so that outsider spirit was uh, with me. But I was an insider, too, because I was fully loving New York and, ex and accepted, had friends, and it was great. And so I had both, uh, you know, a balance kind of of both feelings. And I was, uh, it was being reflected in my music. I loved everything from, uh, you know, I like pop music. I like uh, all the way to hardcore, you know. Yeah. Um, I got into hard, reggae, hip hop. Um, I mean, hip hop played a huge role, influential role in my life before I listened to uh, hardcore in the mid 80s. You know, um, hip hop from 1979 to 1983, four or five was all I was doing. I right. was I was writing raps. I was, you know, writing on beats, uh, making uh, rap crews when I was in seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, you know, we were performing for the school and uh, things of that nature. So I got out of high school. I graduated early because I told my guidance counselor, I remember Westbury High, uh, Mrs. Dickens, great lady. I told them, if I don't, if I don't, uh, if I don't get out of here, I'm going to quit. You What's know, her name? I, Mrs. Dickens. Mrs. Uh, Dickens. I can't Hashtag. remember her first name, but Mrs. Dickens, yeah. A nice Mrs. lady, Dickens. man. She really uh, sweetest lady of all. You know, she was really great. Uh, she had a big blonde uh, uh, beehive hairdo with a, a long face, really thin chin, and very petite woman that 
very educated, nice lady that took care of me in a way. Israel, now I have a crush on Mrs. Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> the picture Mrs. I just Dickens. got was... <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm looking for her on she Facebook awesome. right now. <laughs> Yeah, she was awesome. Just as a side uh, 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 note, yeah. the funniest thing was I was in fourth grade. I had a guitar teacher, and this guitar teacher, this lady, uh, uh, not a guitar teacher, I'm sorry, I had a teacher, mm-hmm. and she would tell us stories about her son. And one day, the way she started on the blackboard, she drew a guitar. She's like, this is what my son plays, right? I was like in fourth grade. Mm-hmm. And she's like, yeah, my son plays this, and on and on and on, and uh, she would tell us all about him as a guitar player. And I got older, and I realized who this guy was by, like, 1990, 1991, and you'll never believe who my fourth-grade teacher was. <laughs> this is Satriani. Oh, I was gonna, oh, oh, no. That's <laughs> funny. I was going to say Steve Vive, but I was close. This is Satriani. Joe Satriani's mother oh, was my fourth-grade teacher. That is amazing. Sweetest lady. Red hair, short, nice little lady. Nice. Anyway... So I graduated school early because I doubled up. I took 11th and 12th grade the same year. I, I had a choice. I could either leave or mm-hmm. I said I would double up. I tried it. I got to, thank God. So I got out in 11th grade early. And the first thing I did was I joined, like, I, I, got, I started playing with musicians. You know, I started going out. I started uh, really venturing into lower Manhattan, mm-hmm. you know, anywhere I could go where music was that I could travel to at 17, 18 years old, I was there. And uh, the only kind of scene I missed, which is funny, is that I, I went all the way to St. Mark's, and but I never went uh, past St. Mark's into the Lower East Side for some reason. And that right. was a lot of what was going on down there. And I, for some reason drew a border around St. Mark's and, well, you know, around that area down there by the, by the cube down there. And I said, I said but, well, that's where I hung out, record stores and all that. So I was in a lot of bands that were down there, like um, bands like uh, uh, Mother Load, Song of Seven. I had a reggae band on Long Island called Uprising. It drew like 300 people. We used to play like David Jones' Chart House, okay. uh, Between the Ribs, Sprats on the Water. Carol's Place. Yeah. yeah, playing like Sprats on the Water, drawing like 200 people uh, every Sunday at Jamaican Me Crazy, man. It was insane. We do mm. half covers and half like original reggae and Bob Marley and all these things. People loved it. Were you always man, a singer? I had like. Were you always a singer or did you play an instrument? I started out as a percussion player. Okay. And backing vocalist in, the, in a lot of these groups. Oh, uh, well, in that reggae group. And then I moved to the front singing position after they heard me singing. You know, they were like, yo, you need to sing some songs. And then the singer, Al, eventually went up and played guitar for um, Mariah Carey. He was the one who was her um, guitar player on that first record she made. You know, she's from Long Island as well. And from Uniondale or Hempstead or something like that. I think and he went and, yeah, okay. And, yeah, and he went and played guitar on her record. And that was his thing. We, you know, the singer left, and I was accompanying accompanying him on backing vocals and some lead vocals I was doing. He was coming to me, so I took over lead vocals and uprising uh, for that band, and that was it. We just, it was great, man. There's a lot of history with that band. If you look it up, um, you know, especially if you link off things on my Facebook page and stuff like that. Yo, I'll put um, links I was to in it another in show notes. So that, that's in, that's interesting. We'll, we'll definitely link was, that up. Was singing, singing always like an easy thing for you? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I used to rap a lot. and But singing was almost easy because I was a baritone. Like I was a bass. My voice is very heavy. And when they try to put me in chorus in school, you know, they got chorus classes and stuff like that. And they try to put me in chorus. They were like, you're a bass. It was like, you can't sing, uh, you know, uh, tenor. And but I liked tenor voices. Who who sings bass except except like you know, like who sings bass? You know, oh, Jim Morrison. So like I, I'm a tenor. Yeah, right. Exactly, Larry Graham. <laughs> but but I mean, you're you're a tenor. So you know, tenors are tenors are getting a lot of songs. So I used to want to be a tenor, but I couldn't sing uh, tenor tone. And that's something that I, I worked on a lot of years, man. Like not with music teachers, but just forcing my voice to sing higher and higher and doing it by singing other people's songs like Bob Marley or somebody with really high piercing vocals that I could try to reach, you know, a lot of soul singers 
And that helped me turn into a tenor singer from being a bass, learning how to control my my vocal instrument, my yeah, I, larynx. I had no idea I was a tenor until I took vocal lessons. And my teacher was like, oh, you're a tenor. And I was like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. But, <laughs> you know, she told yeah, me. Yeah, it means you can't hit certain registers like the low. You, da, 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 da. you can't hit like, you know what it means. So, like, it's like I, I was learning that. And I was like, oh, man. You know, so it didn't come easy to me. But it was some, being in front of audiences or crowds or being in front of people expressing myself was strangely um easy for me because my family enjoyed music i grew up dancing i grew up in the 70s and 80s so i grew up dancing to rock dancing to disco to reggae to dance music um you know uh hard rock music punk whatever i heard when i heard it in the 80s you know everything was kind of dance music back then so expressing yourself was a natural part of the society back then. So, like, for me, getting on stage and dancing around and singing songs is just was just naturally what we were doing in the streets. It wasn't anything different. It just happened to be people now. A lot of people watching it happen, but if you got faith in, you know, Jot Rastafari and you know what you're doing, you faith in yourself realistically, you know what you're doing, and, and you feel like you got something to say and something to offer to people, something to give them that's going to, well, in my case, I want to, Give people love. I want to show people enlightenment. I want to show people they'll get together. That kind of attitude. If you got that, then bam, do it. Go give it to them. You know. So that's what I did. I just, I just gave it my heart and was in many bands. I was in a um, hardcore, um, death metal band called Common Thread, which is uh, I mentioned them on Rise. If you look at the thanks, the credits, oh, nice. Common Thread was like it was death metal in like 1986, seven. Something like that, and these cats were so ahead of their time, man. Like, man, it was like, it was good stuff. So I was doing all that before I was in the brains, you know, all of that. Yeah, that was because that, that that predates a lot of bands. Like, I think Death, you know, Death is arguably the first death, death metal movie. band, and I think that was like '85. So you you guys were definitely right <laughs> right there. Yeah, that dude, that guitar player, man, and the bass player, man. Yo, the guitar player had long blonde hair down to like his waist. And he would just stand there, man, playing that guitar, you know, like crazy, like the craziest music I had heard because, listen, I'd never heard death metal before that. And I was like, yo, what is this? It was like underground stuff, too. And I was singing vocals. They was like, God in heaven, sometimes I can't understand why in this world it's so hard to be a man. It was like crazy, man. Like, that was my first experience at real hardcore audiences, like going to bars and seeing like hardcore kids and like singing. That was Common Thread was my first foray into that world, you know. And that, so, yeah, that. So that like you you did uh, Uprising, did Common Thread, and you hadn't gone below St. Mark's. When was the point that you? <laughs> no, I had not. No, which is weird. What, when was the point you connected? Below St. Mark's with? until like 1992, 93. Really? Wow. wow. Okay. That was right when you yeah. joined Bad Brains. Pretty much. Yeah, 92. I started hanging out with a girl named May, and she uh, she knew um, all about the Lower East Side, right. and uh, me and my friend Chauncey, Sam, May, a lot of us from LI would uh, broke that broke that St. Mark's barrier and started heading down there and we were like oh man like you know finger snap <laughs> you know yeah. we missed the whole but it was cool we got down there it was still a lot going on man and so that was that was that was very good you know cbgb's well, i mean we had been to cbgb's i don't mean i, I haven't i hadn't been to cbgb's but what i met i just didn't hang out in thompson square park and all that too much. right that you hadn't like, been immersed in the culture yet that's what i'm trying to yeah. say i mean i went to cbs but it's like going and plus, you know, there was a real hardcore culture, and I was a 17-year-old kid from Long Island, too. Right. So it was like, okay, I'm not, you know, I mean, we got into one of my one of my worst experiences was being jumped outside of a Bad Brains concert in 1989 to see them going through quickness. That's, me and my friend Eric got jumped. We got beat up real bad. There was a lot so, of that. So, you know, we had a... The, you know, yeah, and so, the same, you know, we were, was a lot of that. Kids from Long Island going into CBs, too, and you kind of had to know what to do, where to walk. And I, it's yeah. something that I, I think a lot of people don't realize or understand the Lower East Side back then, you know, it was, it was run a lot differently. 
uh, when they were hardcore matinees. And even if you went to shows, um, maybe at the Ritz or something like that, you, you kind of had yeah. to know where to go and what to do. Yeah, that's what my that's what my um, that's where I got jumped outside the Ritz, man. It was crazy. We was going to see Bad Brains in um, like '88, '89 when Quickness came out, or '88. And I was wait, what was that? '90? '89, '89. Yeah, '89. Man, we was working a Tower Record because we opened. I, I I worked at the store downtown, and then they decided to open one on Long Island. So I was like, yeah, you know, Call Place. That's right, so like, from Roosevelt Field, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, man, yeah. Okay. yo, I, I was like, that's my hometown. I'm not going to have to come all the way out here. So I, we opened the store on Long Island, man, and I brought record cases in. Then we had to take all the record cases out and bring CD long box cases in and seeing all, like, the you know, changing them all out from albums to long boxes and, like, yeah. all that stuff was going on. You know, a lot of great music came in at that time. Like, Queens Wright came in, um... Freaking like everybody came in at that time. Um, Chili Peppers came in with um, Mother's, Mother's Milk. Milk. Mother's Milk. Um, you know, so many people. Fishbone came in. Um, everybody was hitting. Um, Reality of My Surroundings hit uh, as well. For two Fishbone albums hit while I was there. Um, but the one thing that hit that was on heavy rotation, of course, was Quickness and Bad Brain. Yeah. And we were just blown away by that record. We had it. We had like a, a, a nine CD changer or something at the store, and we would just stick that in there every time. Like it would just be part of the mix. So man, here come Bad Brains to play the Ritz. And uh, long story short, we went out there and stood out there, and some dudes like didn't like what my man was wearing. My friend was wearing Eric, Eric, and he just they just jumped us man it was like quick fast in a hurry so we never got into the spit we never got into the show oh, and uh we got all mashed up and then fun it's a funny thing like when i told daryl that story later on in life like it must have been three years later when i met them and i started doing rides with him mm-hmm. he heard, had heard about that night and that event word to god and he was like yo that was you i was like yeah that, that was me like yo how small the world is you know what i'm saying it, there's just endless so, amounts of irony right now because you get jumped you know it, it, can't make this stuff up yeah that's crazy it's crazy i was sitting there telling it to him and he was sitting on the couch and he looked like he looked seeing a ghost <laughs> like when we first met you know it was like he was seeing a ghost he was like i know the dreadlock that broke y'all up man i know that dread i know he told me about that. That's who I heard it from because I told him the dread came out. Like I was, they was, I was on the ground on the concrete. After a while, I was like, um, I was balled up, and somebody was pulling, pulling at me, and I, I looked up and it was this big dreadlock man. And I grabbed his jacket and I jumped up, man. And the crowd was gone, you know, the, like they had, they had gone, like you know. So like I, I got up with this dude and. He just took me aside, and I looked, and I was like, yo, my friend is still out there. So we we went out and got him, and that dude was the one who told Daryl all about it, man. Wait, crazy. so this was a guy yeah, was. that was with the Bad Brains that yeah, beat you he, up? Yeah, he was hanged. What for? Yeah. No, 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 no. He pulled him. Oh, oh, he, oh okay. Yeah, he pulled me out. Yeah, he, he the dude that happened to be knowing Doc and Daryl and all them and hanging, hanging with them was outside the Ritz. And he pulled, happened to see me. You know, I was I was a dread at that time. So he was like, yeah, you know, he saw a young dread getting beat up by some pure skin. You know, it was like some skinhead mm-hmm. business. Some pure skins that beat him up. And he said, yo, I saw the Nazi dread getting beat up. And I, I went to help him, you know. And, like, he pulled me out. So it was like that. So I got, you know, we got mashed up. But, you know, there was, those were the times. People didn't have uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the the things that they have today that are letting them see that they, the world is bigger than just, you know, uh, you know, controlling a block, man. You can get on the world, uh, on the internet and, and, and put your music out and put your feelings out and put something bigger than that. So times have, you know, changed hopefully, but, um, yeah, I, that's the way it was, you know, before the brain, just a lot of bands, a lot of rock, a lot of Long Island business, you know, hip hop, smoking weed. I didn't smoke weed till I was like 19 years old, man. 
Really? You know, it was like a thing. Yeah. You've made up for it I'm assuming. You've made up for some of those early years. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing double time? I have, since, I have since done triple, quadruple time on that. But, uh, no, nah, it was just something that I was trained as a youth to, you know, abhor. And, like, it was, like, bad. And then I met the Rastafarians, and they showed me a, a different path. You know, they showed me something that was true, that it was, how could God have made a mistake? You understand? Right. Is, 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 is this made by the devil or something? God made everything. If you believe in God, then hmm. this is part of his creation. I was curious when I was looking into you, right? I have been like sort of around reggae my whole life, you know, but, you know, Bob Marley, Bad Brains. And I remember doing a report when I was in high school about Rastafarianism and I was thinking, I was like, I wouldn't even know how to explain it if someone asked me, though. Like, this might be the most white boy question you're going to get, but what is Rastafarianism, and when did you become Rastafari? It, Rastafari is the understanding that in the Abrahamic faith, if you are from one of the Abrahamic faiths, especially Christianity— that Jesus, Yeshua, Isa, whatever you want to call him, Jesus said that he would return two more times. If you read the scriptures in their entirety, all of the prophets, the books of the prophets prophesizing him, his word in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know, taking it seriously. Some people say, that stuff is just made up. Okay, well, whatever. But if you take it literally, if you call yourself a Christian, then if you take all the words in the prophets, all the words in Matthew, Mark, and John, all the words in the in book of Revelation, and some of the words in the letters, because the letters are obviously Paul and them hashing it out, right? Um, you will find that Jesus said he's going to return again as one called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, and you sit on the throne of David fighting ten nations in a worldwide war where he'll be flying around in the clouds and he will have the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, when he does this, all the nations will see him. Every nation will see him. And he, all, all the gospel will be printed in all the languages at that time, and he will win that war, and every nation will then have to acknowledge him as the King of Kings and be like, yo, you're the man. That happened with Haile Selassie. He's the only man that sat on a throne, right, and said, I'm the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Congress, and Tribe Judah, had the Ark of the Covenant, had the throne of Solomon, fought at war, a war, World War II started in his backyard. If you remember, Italy invaded Ethiopia, and Ethiopia and went Haile to the League Selassie of Nations, was... which... That's the, a member of the League of Nations. Okay. Haile, Selassie, Haile Selassie was the 225th king in, uh, king in a bloodline that goes all the way back to uh, uh, the turn of a thousand years ago, and then from that point back to the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon in the Bible. And that, so so you, th- that, this, this that, is- bloodline, that bloodline is Jesus' bloodline. So he stemmed from... Solomon and David and the, the bloodline of Judah. That's it's like twelve tribes that Jehovah chose in the first early books, and those twelve tribes have a job. Each of them, the job of Judah is to be the the kingly bloodline, the kingly line of kings. So the kings are coming out of Judah. So Jesus it was important that he came out of Judah. It was important that other kings came out of Judah. Haile Selassie, that's why they call him the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. That's important. He is the king of a bloodline that extends all the way back to Solomon. Um, and so that bloodline is, uh, uh, you know, has been challenged many times. That bloodline has been perpetrated upon many times. That bloodline has been, people try to say they were that bloodline. But when he sat on the throne and, and Italy, when Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1936, the world got to understand that there was a group of people in Ethiopia, a tribe of people that had left Israel 700 years before Christ and had moved to the land of Ethiopia and had been living there for 2,700 years and had carried the Ark of the Covenant away with them from Israel to Ethiopia. And the world in 1936 got to understand that, and they got to understand that there was a line of kings 
since that time in Ethiopia, and that the king, the present king that was sitting on the throne of David, having the Ark of the Covenant in Ethiopia with the Hebrew bloodline at that time, was a king named Haile Selassie. And his original name before he was crowned in 1930, and his name was changed to Haile Selassie, which literally means power of the Holy Trinity. I power the Trinity. So that's really saying something. His name was Tafari Mokenen as he grew up. That was his name. His family name is Mokenen. His first name was Tafari. He was a Ras, R-A-S, which in the, um, uh, the Giz language, which is the language they brought from King Solomon's court, which is the original Hebrew den, okay, so they brought that from King Solomon's court, is Giz, is uh, Ras means prince. So Ras Tafari, which was his original name, means, and Tafari means son of the creator. Or, 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 or fierce creator. It means fierce creator. So Ras, prince, Tafari, then in English would translate son or prince of the fierce creator. So he was literally, as a child walking around, called Ras Tafari, the son of God. So when you call a, a person Rasta or you say Ras Tafari, you're acknowledging by just saying that in a foreign language, you're saying son of God, son of God, or the one of God. So that's what really Rasfari, in a, in, a, in a word sense, means. But it also is his name before he was changed to Haile Selassie, which is a whole other word sound now, a whole other word that mean, name that means power of the Holy Trinity. But when he was Rastafari as a prince, he was not the power of the Holy Trinity. He was just a prince, assuming the emperor, the, the throne of David, which is the rightful throne of Israel, he became the emperor, he became the power of the Trinity. One important thing also to understand is that Ethiopia were Hebrews, Hebrews, they were sacrificing animals for the forgiveness of sins. They were traveling to Jerusalem for 700 years before Jesus. And when Jesus came, he died. And then in the book of Acts, it teaches that a man named Philip taught an Ethiopian eunuch who was serving Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he went back and told Candace the Messiah had come, the one they were waiting for. The stars were right. The man was persecuted. The man was crucified on a certain date. He was blah, 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 blah on and on. And Candace believed on him. She just was like, okay, that's what happened. And she changed in her day and in her son's day, the entire country of following Hebrews, now there's still a separation today, even Jews in Ethiopia are like, we are not Christians. <laughs> that happened 2,000 years ago, but we are not. But she changed everyone she could to Christianity. She was the first Christian nation on the planet, man. This is why Ethiopia is important, because it's the first Christian nation on the planet. Uh, Armenia uh, signed it and sanctified it into, like, doctrines, uh, uh, documents, like 200 years later. But, but the first... It's written in the Bible. The first Christian nation was Ethiopia. So you have the line of kings in Ethiopia representing Christ. Jesus said, I'm going to return, and I'm going to sit on a throne and fight this war against ten nations, and blah, 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 on and on. And the only man to do everything I just said in history, if you look back through history, flying in the clouds, there was no airplanes before Haile Selassie. The world seeing him, everyone acknowledging him sitting on a throne, there was no TV and television and radio, radio and television before Haile Selassie. There was no, uh, you know, all of these things that he could travel through and fall on the earth. He said he would. He said knowledge would increase when he came in the earth. There was no internet before Haile Selassie. So, you know, we, we looked at Haile Selassie and we said, wow, that's that's it. We're that generation out of all the people for 2,000 years that waited to see this guy. We are the one that saw it happen. We saw Jesus come back in his kingly character and sit on the throne of David in Ethiopia, which is the highest plateau, 7,000 feet in the air on the face of the planet. It's the highest plateau on the face of the world. And Jesus said, I will, uh, God said, I will establish the highest places, the highest mountains. Ethiopia is 7,000 feet in the air, its plateau. He established that. He ruled from there. He set up the United Nations. Look, Israel was, whether you like, you know, whether people have an argument about it, I don't know, but, blah, 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 but Israel was, re, was named 
there was never an Israel. People think Israel existed back in the days. There was never a place called Israel, a place called Palestine, a place called Jerusalem. You know, like he he opened the United Nations. He, he went all over the earth and established a sense of morality among the kings of the earth because they then realized, well, if we can't defeat him, then we got to join him. I mean, they went into this third world nation with military weapons trying to destroy King Haile Selassie. He had to go to England and France before World War II and pay them in gold bullion to fuel their planes and their tanks to come into Ethiopia and fight the Italians. That drove Italy out on the Pope Pius XI, or the 16th. That, was it the 11th or the 16th? You guys can correct me if you look it up, but it drove him mm-hmm. out, and, and Mussolini, of course, who was leading the armies, and it drove Mussolini out of Ethiopia, and, you know, the towns were defeated, and he got seated back on the throne. Remember, he was not, he, he, he left Ethiopia. He got crowned in 1930, but he didn't sit back on the throne until 1938. So it was a period of time he left Ethiopia, and the Italians were, like, being rugged with the country. So if Italy never invaded, we probably never would have known about Haile Selassie. That's why Safari is believing, then, that Christ, if you know in your heart, you don't have to have dreadlocks. And listen, this is really important. You don't have to have dreadlocks to be an Arrasta. You don't have to be black to be a Rasta. You don't have to be African descendant, although we all are African descendants, white or black, to be a Rasta. You don't have to be none of that. All you have to do is understand that there is a important figure that comes along every so often in human history. And this figure, uh, you've heard about him in the Chinese philosophies, in the European philosophies, in the, the Asia, all over the world, from South America to Africa, all over the planet, there's always stories of the one that comes, when man is on the edge. And he comes or she comes, and they establish law, and they establish order, and they establish some barriers for mankind so he don't destroy himself. That's who Ali was. If you want to call him Jesus, you can call him Jesus. We like calling him, say, Christ returned. But in honesty, I understand that he returned for every man. He didn't just return for Christians. or <laughs> He returned for Chinamen, for Europeans, for everybody all over the world, because this is who he saved. The whole world was World War. It wasn't local war. It was World War II. He saved everybody. So this is what being a Rasta is, understanding that, yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I covered all this in my high school paper. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of information. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot to this. So, just a, a quick question um, after that explanation, which I mean, I, I I didn't know any of that stuff. I'm gonna go back and yeah, but um, just to to kind of segue back into to the music part, um, were you Rastafari when you met the Bad Brains? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so. I had uh, been hip to it. You know, my grandmother was a was a Bible person. You know, she's old, older generation. She was seventy something in the eighties, so she was she was thumping the scriptures, man. But um, my grandmother, when I was young, read the Bible a lot and taught me the Bible at a real young age. She tried to teach my other brothers, but they were interested, but nah, not so much. But I kind of had this book she gave me, my book of Bible stories when I was a kid. And it was like this Jehovah's Witness book, actually. It had a lot of illustrations in it about these, like, Bible stories, but they were like these big paintings. And that's what I really liked. I liked the paintings, right? I was like, wow, these are cool pictures, like lions and all these dudes, like, you know, doing stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And so I kept that book because I was drawing out of it. Like, I would draw, reproduce. I like to do art. So I reproduced the scenes on a sketch pad. And because of that, I started reading the stories. And my grandmother always was trying to tell me the stories. So I started reading the stories, and I was like, you know, 10 years, 11, 13, 12 years old. And um, I suddenly started feeling like, I don't know, man, it was weird. Like, um, now I'm getting a little bit weirdness, but, like, for me, we get, we get weird. I've always been like a weird kind of kid, you know, like spiritual, like weird, like feeling energies or like, you know, very sensitive in a way. And I, at that point... I started feeling like I could see what I was reading in the Bible in my head. I could see, I could see King David. I could see the fighting. I could see uh, Moses sitting up there with Jah in front of that golden table, eating and talking about the law and hashing out the law with Jethro. I could see these people became like my local friends. It was like weird, like somehow I could actualize what was going on in that book 
in my brain and I began explaining it to people at a young age. And people were like, how do you know that? And I was like, I just know it. And they were like, but that's true. And they were like, and then I started getting a good feeling from being able to do that. Like I started going, well, this is good. Like people feel good when I do this. And the same thing happened with music. Like I started yeah, did it doing when you were music. Young. And I, it almost parallels what you're doing right now and what you've been doing for many years is is re explaining yeah, this. I mean that even the description you, you gave is a different description than I thought. It was almost broader about Rastafarianism, more inclusive than I would expect or suspected, to be quite honest. And and, and as yeah, a young it, kid it, you're retelling it, stories and here you are doing it this many years later. As you know, yeah. paraphrasing what you were explaining and, and, and here you are doing it again this many years later through the bands you're in, even your your solo reggae, which is more concentrated on Rastafarianism, and even in you yeah. know Fireburn. Yeah, I don't know. I just, you know, some people say, "Oh, the spirit took me," but I don't know what it is. I feel like um, people should just know what really happened instead of saying, "Oh, you know, I don't care if people don't want it or not. That is not my job to make people want the understanding that's found in all the scriptures of the planet." I, that's not what I want. I, really, I, that's nice. That would be nice. But really, I just want people to have a clear understanding of what happened and not something the church teach them or something some 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 uh, shyster teach them because he wants money. I want people to understand what clearly happened and where it happened and who it happened to. And that way they can make a clear choice about if they want to be with this stuff if they want to deal with this knowledge it's not like putting on a costume it's like you know like living your life in a certain way where you're concerned about empathy that's really what it boils down to when i take it all and i boil it down in the pot and i boil it like sugar all the way down to the black essence of the sugar it's empathy left that's all yeah. that's left it's all of these books boil down to one word a fallen out they funnel out to one word empathy that's that's and it means looking at everything like jah or god or whatever you want to call this consciousness is in everything and without it that thing could not be there and it, and it might so, be the human condition you know empathy or compassion might might you, you're sort of boiling down you know what it is to be human um, hopefully, yes. is empathy and compassion. Yeah, and, and, and also the pursuit of art, because if you look, uh, I believe, and I believe, and I, maybe, I may stand corrected at some point, but I believe things like art, music, things like that, separate us from the other creatures. We are, we are artists, right? And the, other, the animals don't do art, unless right. we teach them. And we are musicians, and the animals don't do music, write music and play music the same way over and over again every day unless we teach them. So they, we are really different than the animals. And I think that part of us, empathy, art, those two things separate us from the animals. And we have to preserve that. We have to preserve empathy by all means because empathy and art, like I said, that's it. That's what, that's what we are. Right? If the animals were to be able to sit down and have a council, they'd be like, Yeah, those dudes upright walking dudes, they uh they do they do paintings and they make some funny sounds over and over and over again. Yeah. But they do everything else we do though, they build, they collect food and farming. Farming is another thing animals don't do, right? Right. So farming, right? Think we have specialties as humans that no other creature on the face of the planet does. Now, farming may even be questionable because there may be some creatures that plant seeds and hide seeds or whatever, but I know for sure that art and, uh, and um, empathy is something, and being, putting a point on it, a fine-tuned point, art is something that we do. And so we need to preserve these things, even learn from the other creatures who do examples of these things once in a while because many creatures exhibit empathy of course um, you know so we learn from them we learn from 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 the uh, from our, our experience as a spiritual family and try to try to see what we can do to increase 
food production, increase uh, uh, the, 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 how you deliver food to people, um, how, where, where people are living, see if we can turn some of these abandoned buildings into homes for people, see if we can, uh, you know, get people some health care, some, all these things that are being talked about. These are things that people actually need, food, clothes, and shelter. That, that's what a human condition needs to feel um, viable, food, clothes, and shelter. We have to have empathy in order to give people food, clothes, and shelter. You can't, not, you can't do that without a sense of my fellow man or I am my brother's keeper. You can't. You, know, you can't be like Cain and be like, what am I, my brother's keeper? That's how Cain was when God said, what is what? Where is Abel? He was like, I don't know. What am I, my brother's keeper? Like, that's, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Where is your brother? Right. So, you know, that's why we have to be. And that's what I think Rasta showed me as a kid running up in the streets, you know, doing hip hop and running around in the streets. Rasta said to me, look, you know, settle down and check out the bigger picture, which is humanity. You know, a humanness. What can you do to put us together? And that, and that was very influential. I mean, that's an, an, an incredible way you've explained it and eloquent. And mm-hmm. you were Rastafarian before you met Bad Brains. And, and I wonder about that connection, you growing up, hearing the Bad Brains, your stories about even getting uh, beat up at the Bad Brains show. But how did it come to be? That must have been a leap Getting into the bare brains, like that whole story, I'm fascinated with. How did you get into the bad brains? Yeah, it was uh, a pretty crazy thing. Um, I, like I said, I was doing all that stuff we talked about, and I was uh, at that point uh, playing an uprising, uh, which was the, the, turned out to be the biggest group I had before bad brains. And we were literally bringing like 200 people every Sunday to Splash on the Water for three one-hour sets. And that's how we would play Uprising. We played three one-hour sets anywhere we played. We would a half-hour break in between. And I want to big up Mike and Larry and everybody else that was involved. Larry, the bass player, he's since passed away, but he, he was like, such a great bass player, and we would just rub a dub all night. And I had just started smoking marijuana. Um, even when I became a Rasta at 17, 18, I didn't smoke marijuana. I didn't. I just didn't. I just was straight edge. I actually was straight edge. Like really? when I was growing up, I had chosen that. Like at like 15, I started hanging out with cats that introduced me to that, and I was like, yo, that's what I'm. That's what I'm dealing with. And I, I really abhorred the thought of smoking marijuana. I was like, what is that? And like, my friends were smoking. I was like, y'all crazy. What are y'all doing, man? Smoking this weed, man. Why, why are you doing this? We don't need this. You know, I was like that. And, but then one day we were sitting in the park, and I'll get, to, I'll get to the bad brains, how that happened. One day we were sitting in the park, and uh, I just said, yo, pass me a joint. They passed me a joint. I said, I want to see what this is all about. I said, I want to prove to y'all this is foolishness. <laughs> I smoked it, right? And I, I right? <laughs> that's how Jaw works, you know. That's how Jaw works. I, I smoked it and I didn't get high, and I was like, you know what? This is foolishness. Y'all are, y'all are not getting high. This is crazy. I'll just think you it's like placebo, a placebo or something, placebo effect. So I went to my friend's house, and that was where I met. Um, uh, we, we hung out that night, and that's kind of where I met. Uh, a uh, girl named Latasha. So that night, after we left that whole party, now Latasha becomes important to the bad brains. Like after we left that whole party, I'm like at Sam's house and we smoke again and I get high. And so from that point, I start like, I start smoking weed. Now, uh, I'm, I start dating Latasha and Latasha becomes my girlfriend. And, um, so I did for like a year, year and a half, off and on, you know. And one day she calls me up and she's like, yo, I went to the craziest place today. I was like, where'd you go? She was like, I went to an audition. And it's like 1992, beginning of 92. She was like, I went to an audition 
to sing for Bad Brains. <laughs> no, like, Natasha what? went to an audition? Latasha. Yep. L- Latasha L- went to Latasha. An... For Bad yep, Brains. my girl. Okay. So I was like, what? You went to sing for audition? She was like, yes. Yeah. Like, it was happening downtown, and there was like a lot of people there. <clears throat> How, uh, she was like, I was going to tell you about it, but I just found out today, and I went down straight to it. And she was like, I was just there, but I gave, when I when I was there, I, I saw Daryl Jennifer, and she was like, oh, I tried out and everything. She was like, you know, but I saw Daryl Jennifer, I talked to him for a minute, and I told him to call you. I was like, what? For real? She sounds like she a keeper. Like, yeah. Huh? She sounds like a keeper. That's a that's a good. Oh man, she was deal. awesome. She was awesome. She was like this cool sister from uptown. Had one big dread from the top of her head. It was like a. It was wild, man. She looked like a. Uh, I don't know, just like a anime character or something. She would dress in these big tall boots, and uh, she had this big long dreadlock, and uh, she was really something else. She would have these wild outfits and really kind of Parliament funkadelic. Fast forward to. Uh, 1989 or 1990 or whatever it was. So she was something else with Tasha. I think she's still out there. God bless her wherever she is. Um, I don't really hear from her too much anymore, but uh, at all. But God bless her. You know, um, she hears this. God bless her. She says, "Yeah, I got gave I gave Daryl Jennifer your number." <laughs> and so you know, I'm I'm bugging out. I'm like, oh, "What? That's crazy!" Because you know, actually, I should tell you quickly mm-hmm. before that. I had gotten into Bad Brains with my friend Eric in like 1986, 87. Okay. And uh, I and I was out. And he, that's when I was turning into a Rastafarian. And he was telling me that, you know, if you listen to punk rock and stuff, how are you, you going to be into a Rastafarian? You not know about Bad Brains. I didn't know about them. Mm-hmm. Um, um, he was like, you got to know about this. He was older. He was an older cat than me. So he knew about stuff that he was turning me on to. So he turned me on the eye against eye. And then I went out and got, um, attitude and then I was right. like on, you know what I'm saying? So, um, then I got into human rights, HR band, and I was seeing him every week, every time he played the SOBs, I'd go down there and see him. So it was like that. I got to know HR before I knew the bad brains, me and HR been nice. friends three years before I knew the bad brains. We still friends till this day. I spoke to HR yesterday. Me and HR are still friends till this day. So I met HR down there. But anyway, um, she's like, yeah, you know, um, I gave him number. So I'm like, okay, cool. That's that's really good of you. That's awesome. So is he going to call me? Yeah, he called his brother. Okay. So like a couple weeks went by, I think. And um, one day I'm chilling in my mom's house, you know, out in Westbury. And she comes in like somebody's on the phone for you. And that's how it was. I got on the phone and it was Daryl. And I couldn't believe it at first. I thought it was somebody pranking me, but then I quickly remembered, right, <laughs> that what was going down. And I was like, oh, man, I was like a month ago, man. So I tripped, like, wow, man, that's crazy. You know, what are you, what, what's happening? You know, he's like, yeah, you know, it's like, he's like, uh, I heard that, uh, you know, that you're a singer and that you, you, you quite possibly could sing in our group, you know, and you can, you can handle this music. And I was like, I'm, like, I'm a singer, man. I'm a singer, songwriter. And, and man, I, you know, your group is the most. You know, I was right. like, this is your group is the most amazing group to me. And I would love to come up and jam with y'all. So we had a long conversation, not about music, strangely enough, but about family, children. And yeah. He was talking about his kids and all this stuff. And I was like, cool, man. So we got together a week later up in Woodstock, New York, which is where they were residing. And I couldn't believe it because I thought I was going to go see them in some old, like... <laughs> like a squat, you know, you know downtown. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying, yeah. man. <laughs> you know, like a squat, they breaking shit down and like, like come on in, Israel, we, we're about to burn this whole city down. Right, right. That, you know, that would make I, sense. <laughs> but I went up there, Bad Brains was, uh, was chilling in the woods, man. Daryl had trimmed off his dreads, and uh, they were just sitting up in the woods chilling, man. And I was like, wow, like, you know. So I came up, and uh, they were like, took me to the studio the next day. And it's like, all right, 
you know, so what songs do you know? Because, you know, we hung out all night. We got right. to, you know, talk and chill. And, but we went to the studio. It was like this barn, man. It was like a big barn up in the sticks somewhere. And uh, it had a stage set up in it and sound system and stuff. And he was like, it was like a rehearsal studio. Yeah. And he was like, so, all right, so what songs do you know? I was like, well, I know pretty much all your Everything. songs. I know all your songs, right? And it wasn't on purpose, right? Which is weird, which is how the creator is like, how things happen, you know? It's like, I don't know, but so I was like, I know all your songs. He's like, <laughs> he's like, come on, man. He's like, what song do you know? And I was like, man, play anything, man. Play anything by Bad Brains. I know it. He's like, all right. So he's like, you know, Reignition? I was like, yeah. He's like, play Reignition. So they played it. I sang that shit. I sang it. Yeah. And, you know, I did my best. Sang the shit And then he was, right? <laughs> and then he was like, he didn't say nothing. So I was like, okay. So he said, you know, Soulcraft? He kept leaning into the microphone, talking to me. You know, Soulcraft? It's Daryl. Doc was quiet. I met Doc, and Doc didn't say much to me the first day. He was, what's up? What's up, man? All right. Cool. And he was really quiet. And so he's like, you know, Soulcraft? And I was like, yeah, I know Soulcraft, you know? So he started playing. I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, Daryl, you didn't go. Right? <laughs> so he started laughing. So we chopping it up, and he yeah. did it. We started singing Soulcraft. Oh, he does that? Soul that's, Craft, not a, that's not HR? On... No, that's not HR. That's Daryl. Oh, uh, wow, that makes tidbit. It, Okay, that's, that's Daryl describing how the bass uh, guitar goes to oh, Mackie okay. before they record it. Because remember, that album was recorded really quickly, and HR wrote the lyrics in like 24 hours or something. I think I heard that on a Bad Brains documentary, but I didn't remember that. I man. still always picture HR doing it. Daryl, Daryl going to Mackie. Yo, look, Mackie, this should go like this. That's the bass line. Yeah. So he's explaining the bass line to Mackie. Yeah. And then Mackie just goes, that's how they do, man. That's how the bad brains are. They, they're very vocal about the, the way the music goes, very rhythmic. You got to know how to do, make noises with a lot of funk because they're based in funk. Right. They, they want, right? They're based in funk. So a lot of funk groups, you see them, you know, like they'll vocalize it. how the music's supposed to sound, you know, and he, he, they come out of that tradition. So that's, that's him doing that. Um, so yeah, man, um, I thought we, we did that and then he stopped midway. And I thought, oh shit, he stopped playing. But he had a big smile on his face. And I thought, well, what's going on? And he said, yo, Doc. He's like, yo, this is the man. You know, he said, he sound exactly like Joe. You know, he sound exactly like HR. And I was like, I was like, cool, thanks. And Doc was in agreement. You know, he's like, yes, I hear it. And it's amazing. You know, he's like, and we played a few more songs. We just played then. Then we just, then we just played. We played like uh, a lot of their early hardcore stuff. And it was a, it was like a it was like a dream, man. It was like standing there for a half hour playing with Bad Brains for the first time in my life. And every song that started, it sounded like I was playing the records in my bedroom. So oh. I just knew what to do. It was like it's like it was like a reaction. Like, it's like, like it's, I knew where it was coming in. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're singing and, um, in the car to the CD. <laughs> yeah, it was the same way. It was just like. Boom. It's like that's that happens right there. It's like I knew every vocal part. That that was mystifying though, like how like I had learned all that stuff, like uh not knowing any of that was gonna happen. Did, did you anyway, know that, that that was the plan? You could do that or you know, it's like singing in the shower. People who sing in the shower then think they can sing, they go to sing and they cannot. Did you have like an opposite mm -hmm. thing where you're like, I know bad brains inside and out, I can do this and you got there, or were you like surprised like getting up there that you just trial by fire and, and and you got it wow no one has ever asked me that question it's what that i do is real question it's what i do wow it that took, is deep it took us two weeks to write that one <laughs> it took me <laughs> less than half a second <laughs> oh my god no that is that is really deep um Wow, when I got there, what was I thinking? I got there 
And I was literally thinking that it was providence. Right. Which is a a theme in your life. From what I'm getting from you is serendipity, synchronicity, providence. Like, this is what I'm getting from you, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling, when I'm standing there, I'm going, this is crazy as it is, it's meant to be. And just put that mic to your mouth, open and sing. Sing, believe that this is supposed to be happening. This is where you are. You know, like actualize this moment without doing all, without saying all that stuff to myself that I'm saying right now. I mean, it just was happening naturally. Like, you know, like this is, uh, this is a moment in your life, you know? And before, like I went up there, like I was talking to my girl and I was like, you know, I was like, she was like, uh, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. You know? I was like, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because going, stepping into HR shoes is a big, Vision, you know what I'm saying? And I, I didn't think about it as stepping in HR shoes, actually, but I know most people would have been like, yo, who's this kid coming to think he's going to sing Bad Brains, you know? And, uh, yeah, that's got to be some like unknown, a big, some unknown kid. Yeah. It's, it's in retrospect, like, it, you know, when you think about it now, it's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's a big thing. That's HR is not just number one, he's one through five. Yeah. You know, what's that KRS one <laughs> lyric? It's, I'm not, uh, I'm sorry. I'm not saying number one. He's like, uh, I'm sorry. I lied. A number one, two, three, four, and five, and that's HR. And he's yeah. like, your attitude towards yeah. it is 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 what? I'm not stepping into his shoes. I'm what? What is your attitude towards it? I am. I am bringing an additional Rastafarian force and continuing the message in the time that the brother cannot do it. And mm-hmm. I literally mm-hmm. felt the same energies like Joshua with Moses, you know, or like Elijah with Elisha, you know, like this is the brother that has gotten a little on and maybe feeling a little like he don't want to do it. And the younger has to step up right now for this moment. And so if you know the story about Moses and Joshua, you know, Joshua had to step up when Moses was like, oh, man, I'm not doing that no more. I'm tired. We got um, to reset something here real quick. Yeah, I'm we, sorry, Israel. Two minutes or a minute? <laughs> How long does this it. take? Hello, everybody. This is Ed Reyes from Amityville, and you are listening to If I Rule the World podcast. Real quick to like jump back to to what we were talking about. Um, you said that you were friends with with HR for like three years before you even met the Bad Brains, and here you are kind of um, stepping in for him. Um, what was the relationship with him like at that point? Like him knowing that you were going to, I guess, take okay. over. Well, I met HR uh, as I said about three years before in like eighty eight, uh, eighty nine going to see him perform with human rights uh because bad brains wasn't performing and the one time i did go to see bad brains i told you what happened so yeah i was seeing hr a lot because he was performing a lot i don't know if you remember like hr would come to sobs or you come to like wetlands or long come island to, too they did a show out in bayshore hr uh, bayshore he, he played Sundance. yeah he played a few places so that was when hr was um uh, did charge and he was HR is always heavily in the spirit but you know HR was um, really uh, mashing down the walls of Jericho so to speak at that point and he had become a real leader you know he'd become a real uh, focal point of spirituality for myself 
and a lot of my friends and a lot of people in music, of course. And so to go see him and stand three, four feet away from him in the uh, wetlands, it was a, uh, uh, <laughs> it was un- indescribable almost at that point. I mean, I wasn't like this kind of fan that was like, oh, my God, posters and all that. I wasn't like that. I was more like, dude, this is serious. This is like a movement. This is this dude is literally singing in a in a in a unique, uh, amazing way. And he's leading this movement of Rasafara. And that's why I was really into him, you know, not like a fan kind of thing. And a lot of people say the same thing. You hear it echoed over and over for decades going to see the Bad Brains was a religious experience, whether you were religious or not. Or not. It, it was otherworldly, and that like was... Like, say, spiritual. It was, mm-hmm. it was a spiritual experience. Mm-hmm. Spiritual, spiritual experience. experience. Yeah. yeah, that everybody could participate in, whether you dealt with Rasta or not. You felt, if there is a spirit, if there is a spirit of man, this dude is encompassing that spirit, and he's showing it to us, live and direct, with no apology and all in the open. And here is your chance, come one and all, to see the human spirit at its finest, come one and all. You know, this man is a human, but look at what he's done with his humanity. You know, like, whoa, what can we all learn from this man? You know, yes. how, can we, how can we achieve the things that he has, he is displaying? Um, it was like seeing Bruce Lee, you know? It was like seeing Bruce Lee. It was like seeing something you had never seen on the planet before, um, Haile Selassie, because there was no TV before Haile Selassie. There was no radio before Haile Selassie. So, like, to see these people is a unique thing. We may have never seen them had we been born 10 years before His Majesty was born. We, obviously, we wouldn't have seen them had we been born before His Majesty. Right. So we have to really give thanks that we were born in the 20th century during the time of His Majesty that we could see these people and see these events and see things like John Kennedy and, uh, you know, all these people that we saw that came along with him to change our world. So H.R. was one of those people, and I, and, I, and I knew it. I was like, this is one of the people that came along with that experience to help the changing of our world from a world of horse and carriages to a world of electronics and amazing things, you know, two, three, four, thousands of years. Who knows how long we spent with horse and carriages? Look at where we are now, Mercedes Benzes and a uh, computer in my pocket. So I'm not driving a Mercedes, but I'm just saying, like, you know, we have these kind of things going on. So um, I saw HR, and HR was at the SOBs one night after, like, five, six times of seeing him. And um, he, I was leaving. And I was with, again, with May and Chauncey and Sam, some people I, that I'd hung with all the time. I always mention them. Um, we were leaving, and I literally had my back turned, and I felt a hand tap my back. Right. And I turned around in the SOBs, in, in wetlands it was, excuse me, in wetlands, and it was HR standing behind me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had tapped my shoulder. And I turned around, and he had his hand in the universal symbol of peace. If you see that, Hadi Selassie does that a yeah. lot. We, right? That and sort of like diamond um, thing mm-hmm. you do with your hand? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hadi said that that is the universal symbol of peace, that that is recognized throughout the universe as peace. So he did that uh, to me, and he greeted me, and he asked me, so you want to come smoke some herb? We introduced himself. So I'm Israel, HR, right? You want to come smoke some herb with me for a second? I want to talk to you. I was like, what? I was like, what? You know, no way. I was like, okay, great. And my friends are like, so I went downstairs with HR in the SOB, in the wetlands, down to, the, I guess it was the dressing room, I'm thinking. And there was a bunch of people down there. Everybody getting, smoking out, getting high. And I walked in there, and I just started smoking herb, too. He sat on the couch, and strangely enough, everybody was sitting on the ground, and Like, it was like all these girls in there, I remember, and like some dudes, but they were all sitting on the ground or standing in a corner, and HR, the whole couch was open, and HR sat on that stuff. I don't know if I'm being too detailed, but it, these things matter to me. It's like, the way it was was weird. Like, HR sat on one side, and I, I sat on the other side. And he was passing a joint to me back and forth. And, um... 
he was leaning over and whispering near me all these all this philosophy about Rastafari. It was the first time we met. I mean, he was saying all this stuff about Haile Selassie and Rastafari and uh, all this, uh, you know, the philosophy. And he kept saying, if I understand, in the Rastafarian word, seen, S-E-E-N, seen, seen, like you understand? You see, have you seen what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying, seen? And I kept saying, yeah, seen, seen, seen. This, the, like, just to be clear, he, you two were on a couch talking to each other and you said there were people sitting on the ground, like, Sitting on the this? ground in front of us, like 20 people, man, like just sitting there talking or smoking or like checking us out or like passing a joint. And he brought me down to that situation. And I was like, what is going on down here? It's like a, like a, like a, like a whole other uh, hangout or something. But I guess it was the backstage. You know, like, I'm a man now and i am been doing music for 25 years. And I was like, I guess that was the backstage, but I really have never seen nothing like that yeah, in my whole like life. It's like a different backstage. type of backstage. That's why I bring it up. It almost sounds like uh, talking to your guru, you know, <laughs> like a different, yeah, you man. Know, other, it was it's not most out. backstages. It was, it's not exactly uh, the backstage of uh, CBGB <laughs> as we know it, you know? <laughs> yeah, man. It was, it was weird. And it, I'm telling you, it was either the wetlands or the SOBs, but I'm sure it was the wetlands. Wetlands, It's like yeah. a little staircase mm. that you can go downstairs. To, if you're facing the stage, this you can go downstairs. And I know SOBs, I don't think, had it downstairs. So wetlands it had to be the wetlands. Yeah, wetlands did. Yeah, so it was down there. And I remember, so we sat there, man, and he was telling me all this stuff. And we sat there for like, 25 minutes. It was so long that I was looking at my watch going, you know, my friends must have left. Like, you know, they must have broke out. But he wrapped it up. He was like, all right. He was like, you. He was like, stay positive. PMA, all right? Rastafari. Like, he was like a kind of general in a way. Like, he was kind of like commanding. Like, it was cool. I was like, wow, man, he's really powerful. Like, he was a like, yes, I. Like, really strong hands. Little but tough hands, you know, like hard. I was like, wow, man, this guy is something else, you know? He, like, led me upstairs, walking in front of me, he had this strut going on, like, you know, you had, like, little bow-legged strut mm -hmm. with dreadlocks hanging down. I was really impressed, you know? Yeah. I like, guess this guy is a, he's an impressive individual. And um, he led me back upstairs, and the guys were still waiting, so we left. And he, before we left, he told me, come back. He remembered my name. He's like, Israel, I won't forget you. He's like, come back and see me. And that's, that's what we did. HR was back in town and we go back. Now I was always hanging out with HR. It was HR's friend. We HR, me and HR friends. So we hanging out, smoking weed. Now it was more chill, chill environment. Now HR, he hit me at the roster thing. So when I meet him now, he's like, what's up, man? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Go chill, we smoke, talking. So we had known each other. But then like, in 1990, 91, HR stopped performing, and he didn't live in New York. So when he stopped performing, I stopped seeing him. See what I'm saying? Uh, by the time I got with Bad Brains, I hadn't seen HR in like a year and a half. So I'm telling Darren and Doc, I know HR. I know, <laughs> yeah. and HR know each other, but, you know, it was just bugged out because it was like I hadn't seen him in a long time. And then, then I joined the Brains, and I didn't see him at all. Right. Like he just fell off the map. He was going through his thing at that point in the beginning of the 90s. And, uh, you know, we all wondered about him and prayed about him, but I didn't see him at all until actually the end of the 90s. Um, and we reminisced about how weird life is that all that happened. And there was never, a, like, a, a problem, animosity, nothing between you guys because you got into the bad brains. No, never, man. HR... That's good. I, Even I, seeing pictures seen... of you guys together, there was, like, a bunch of pictures going around when Fireburn played... And HR came and you guys together. And I have to say, a lot of people that saw it, it was very heartening to see you guys like doing the diamond symbol together and the Rastafarian symbol. And it was, it was nice. And I don't know why, you know, I thought maybe there was something bad between you guys because you were in mm -hmm. bad brains. Maybe it's just rumor. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had that question before and, a lot of folks did imagine that. Even through the 90s, I got that question. Um, even in Bat Brains, I got that question. But right. HR has always been a big brother to me. HR has always been great, and we are very close. And I spoke to HR 
I speak to HR at least once a week, and if not more. Okay. And we are very close. We fell out of touch, as I said, from like 1990 until the end of the 90s because he was sick and he was not living in New York, and I didn't have that. The relationship I have with him now, it hadn't developed to that point yet where we were calling each other. But now me and HR are always on the phone. Uh, we're always talking about life. Just We're just brothers, you know, just we're not, we just talk, you know, we just talk like normal dudes. You know, just out of cu- stuff. just out of curiosity, did did you watch the documentary that was made on him recently? Yes, I did. By James, uh, made by James. Yeah. Lathos. Yep. Lathos. Yeah, I did. What'd you think great, of it? Great stuff. Okay. Good stuff. Shows the uh, reality of uh, of Joseph's struggle through the spiritual world, and like the Egyptians. Uh, taught us in the Book of the Dead that there are many traps and perils and things you have to escape. And these things is what HR was facing as a shaman. You know, you, you go through the traps and the perils, and uh, sometimes it's, you, you, you're victorious, and sometimes the traps are holding you down and, and people are witnessing that, that, that happening to you. And also sometimes you are being called to display things that people don't understand, like in the case of wearing a wedding dress, you know, like Christ said that man is the bride, man is his bride, you know? And so symbolically wearing a wedding dress, HR became the bride of Christ, you know? And things like that, you know, I saw past showing up to a show with a punk rock, with a, with a, 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 a motorcycle helmet on. I thought that was the most punk rock thing anyone has done in, 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 in a long time, you know what I'm saying? That I thought that true. if That's that was being done in the heights of the, of the days that would have been considered cool. You know, why is everyone this and blah, blah, blah. but so, you know, I, I saw HR maybe because I'm a friend, but I just saw HR differently. I saw it like, this is his shamanistic path and uh, we need to embrace him and not send him, you know, even if, you know, we just need to embrace it and make sure it's not, not hurting anyone or not hurting himself. But, don't tell the man that he's crazy because HR is not crazy. I know HR. Maybe that's why I was able to say those things because I know him personally. He's never once displayed that side to me. And I know HR is just going through some things, you know, and he's, he's displaying that because the spirit is, he's, he's fighting those spirits. But when he and I talk, he's always steady. So I'm like, yo, you have to give HR a moment to figure out himself. And that's what that, film was you know hr in his moment of passing through those gauntlets now he's through that and i don't know if you guys have heard him or seen him lately but i saw him last HR's. year i saw him last year uh at riot fest chicago um uh, bad Rose. oh well he's changed a hundred percent since then as well he's totally um totally better you know he had an operation he had a vein that was yeah. or a muscle that was constricting a vein up in his head. Wow. And he had to have an operation. So like, you know, he um he had cluster headaches for years. Like fifteen, twenty years he had these headaches where he just would was debilitating headaches, man. Feel so bad for him. You know, people didn't know a lot of struggles HR went through, you know. That was a surprise um, learning that whole yeah. thing about him and being like okay, because there was some moments over the years of him and Soul Brains that subjectively were disappointing. You know, you don't yeah. need him to do backflips, but he was, you know, behind on the songs. And then hearing about that, I think even Bad Brains members were like, wow, I didn't know that. And then it was that operation. Yeah, man. There was something physically wrong with him, man. He couldn't, he just couldn't do shows. He couldn't, he couldn't, the music was like so loud, he felt like his head was exploding. But it was this thing that was, banning up his but you know what happened is like spiritual warfare is like a basketball game the coach calls you out and he sits you down and he calls you back out you haven't done anything wrong you ain't messing it's just not your time to play right now Hmm. and that's the way it is with spiritual activities spiritual activities is that way you get called out and then you get set back on the bench. And then you said, number 34, get up and get out there. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's like a thing like that. So you just gotta keep the faith. You just gotta because in your personal life it's happening too, not just the external life. It's happening in your personal life where your certain certain aspects of your personality are called out to handle the situation. So it's like that within and without. And um HR went on a trip where the most high had him experiencing some other things and you know I I can't account for every single thing that happened with HR, but I can say that HR was, uh, you know, he's he's doing he's doing well. You know, I speak to him all the time, and um, he's making new music. Just sent me a new track the other day, and it sounds his voice sounds great. I mean, that's honestly if good to listen. hear as someone close to the source, someone who knows him like you, and you know that that that's that's good to hear. And he was at the Fireburn show, right? So I guess he was, I mean, definitely yep. at, le- at least checking out the songs and stuff. So there's the EP, and then the, you guys just released, what, Shine, which has two songs? Mm-hmm. And uh, those are pretty fucking great songs, if you ask me. Uh, control, mm-hmm. Comptroller or Controller, right? Mm-hmm. And then what was the other song, Shine? Shine. Yeah, man, those, those are two really killer tracks, um, as well as the... Yeah. Um, the, the the first release and uh how did you hook up with Todd Youth? Daryl Jennifer had an art exhibit in Los Angeles. And he also had he also had, he also played here and this was about two years ago. No 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 it's about a year ago now. And uh that's where Todd and I met. That's the first time you met him. Yeah. Was that recent? About a year, about a year and a half ago. Wow. About a year and a half ago. Yeah. So that's the first time we met and and were in constant contact. We we had met each other in passing during Bad Brains because Doc and Todd Youth and Daryl have been friends since Todd was thirteen years old. So by the time I was in Brains in nineteen ninety two, ninety three, ninety four, Todd had owned a restaurant. And we went there to eat one time, and I met Todd. But, you know, man, I was a young kid, and I was meeting a lot of people. And although Todd and I are the same age, um, I, I, you know, I knew Todd, but I didn't, I didn't, it's not somebody that we stayed in contact over the years. But I knew, I knew Todd, and um, I saw, you know, he, he saw me at Daryl's uh, event. And what he did was he contacted me via email, right? We actually didn't physically meet at that event. He contacted me during email, during, uh, via an email. And he said to me, hey, you know, Israel, Todd Youth, I saw you at Daryl's thing, and I got these songs that I've been working on, and I thought about you to sing on them, sing on the vocal. Would you try to write some vocals to these songs? Now, I've been, strangely enough, for like four, three or four years, wanting to do um, a hardcore album. And I do, a, I play a lot of instruments, but I'm, you know, self-taught. And I feel like I want to work with dudes who are just knowing their craft and do this new burst of sound. I, yeah. I was hearing like, hard like driving music in my head um double bass in my head i don't know why but like and like I, at first it was coming out like four years ago it was coming out like some kind of like queen's right shit like i was singing like i just want to say that the fact that you mentioned queen's right twice really i love it because I, I fuck with the empire record heavy but i'll let you finish guys <laughs> and i just want to say that israel has sang to us I think four times on this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're breaking ground. Your intro, sing and singing to us. And he, and new things uh, has never happened. He's on this doing. Podcast. He's doing his best. Best Jeff Tate. So I appreciate that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> that's hysterical, bro. You're right. You're right. And that's and it's funny, man, because that's like you know, it's like it's like kick ass shit going on. Right? I'm like, I want to make some kick ass shit, right? And that's what, like, that's what don't stop the youth. Like you could just tell, like when, when I hit play, like it's just, 
Like I was telling George, it's just like you know what you're getting, and then the second song has this like wailing ass solo. Like you guys killed it on on those two releases. Yeah, we we he. I listened to the record, and I was uh, not the record. I listened to the demo. It was just the music, and I was like, "This is what I've been freaking thinking about doing. Like this is it. Like I listened to a few bands. I was actually in a band in that direction." going in that direction before Fireburn. And mm. we hadn't chosen a name for the band, but it was Dave Urban from 25 to Life. Yeah. It was me. It was Nick Menza on drums. Nick from Menza, Megadeth. Megadeth. Holy shit. R.I.P. Yup. Yeah. R.I.P. He uh, died while we were doing that project, son. Motherfucker, man. That he was on Rust in Peace, man. Like that he was he was the real deal. God damn. Yo, word to God, we had a dope project with four songs that we wrote. One of them called Jump the Walls. We gonna jump the walls. We gonna cry those walls. It was it was great. Like crazy music, right? God damn. And we was working on it at Nick Menz's house up in the valley. Wow. And um, Dave was sending us the tracks. And oh my God, yo, Nick went to play on a boat. Man, my friend, my friend went to play on a boat and he died of a heart attack. I was, couldn't believe it. I mean, young like young right like had to be in his fifth like 50 maybe if even yeah man we were like almost the same age man wow. and i was like oh it broke me man I was, it broke my heart man i was like man so that happened like a year before i, I met with met up with todd so i'm like listen to the music todd sent me but i, I so i'm like oh man this is this is it this is like what you know so just stream of consciousness. I just started writing. Uh, it was uh, the songs he sent me were the songs, uh, like about five songs, uh, three of which or four of which ended up on the EP. Three or four of them ended up on the EP. And um, Suspect, Break It Down. It was just stream of consciousness. I just heard the music. And like I said, I'd been singing stuff in my brain beforehand for years. So like it just started coming out, you know what I'm saying? And like Suspect came out. And um, I went to see them, like, the next week. And I was like, yeah, man, I got some stuff. And we did it, and it was just on. We recorded a demo of it, took it home, and we were like, yo, what do we have here? You know, this is really great. Like, we like it personally. We're jamming it, and we're going, man, this is, the, you know, we're feeling like 17-year-old kids going, this is the shit, you know, this is going to kill them, blah, blah, blah. Like, but we're like, yo, what are we going to do about this, you know? Um Todd had nails, uh, Todd Jones, um, Todd Youth had uh, blood clot. I had really nothing going on <laughs> except, you know, I was doing some other things on some other levels that I, that I did have going on. And your, and your solo Nick, stuff, you're on SoundCloud. I listened to a bunch of your solo reggae stuff, which is great. Yeah, I was, I was writing a lot of solo records, working a lot of um, um just ideas out and put them up online because I didn't really, they're up online because I didn't want to lose them really. That's really why they're, they're up there. Um, they're not finally mixed or anything, but yeah, I did all that stuff myself, you know, or mix, arrange, compose, all of it myself. But I was working on other things too outside of music. Um, I was working with a lot of nonprofit foundations like um, environmental causes and stuff like that too, um, which was really important to me. So we were like, what are we going to do with this? And like we put it out. That's what we're gonna do with it. At that point, you never know what the reception will really be. But if you believe in it and you think it's good, then you know you put it out and you see what happens. You know. And the reception we've gotten has been so great, man. We're just so thankful for it. You know, because people could have been like, it could have gone the other way. But we put it out and people were really responsive. And we're just really thankful, man. We're happy to be doing Fireburn. Don't Stop the Youth was an amazing thing to record at NRG Studios with uh, Kyle on the mix. And we did that in like a day, two days at the max. And um, we, we included a mix. And, um, you know, we, we put it out. And we had a uh, cool brother paint the cover for us. It's an actual painting, the tiger. 
Yeah, that's uh, and yeah. then we went ahead and yeah, that's an actual painting. Like somebody painted that like whole thing. Just listen to the the record, which is great because they heard like a tiger, like tiger style. So I was like, cool, that's pretty interesting, you know. Um, so yeah, don't stop the youth was was Todd and I meeting and getting together and becoming fast friends. I can honestly say Todd is one of my best friends. We became fast friends. We're always talking, and we 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 get along great. You know, sometimes you meet people, you want to work, but you don't really get along. It's different when you get along with them. Great, yeah, we're yeah. really good friends. So it's funny, like you meet so long ago, but then like fast forward, like twenty five years later, you just like something happens, and you just chop it up and like hit it hit it off and then you start making these fucking uh great like great music together and i guess like once you you know when you're in a room and you hear something back you're like shit you like if we're bumping our own stuff like like you said you believe in it and it's something that you wanted to do you know cuz like george said you're doing like a lot of the solo stuff but this is like a different um a different animal basically like you get that that aggression side of you and uh mm -hmm. if it makes you feel young again you guys still work so you put out like the the, the the other two songs like that was like maybe this year it came out right mm -hmm. yep it took a couple more months and we put out the other single uh, about three more months um we put out shine and uh what what it is is that we've been working and writing and uh we got a, a lot of songs written and we're, we're trying to, you know, we're working towards a record, working towards a full length. Um, but, uh, we think that, uh, it's kind of, a a nice thing to put out some, uh, songs before we get there, you know? And then when we get there, we do the full length and then, you know, some more songs, you know, we just keep creating, you know, and put out, put out the best of what we have. Uh, we're not, put on everything of course we have because you know you fine tuning or some things just don't make the cut but um you know we, we try to put out put out uh quality material with quality uh uh you know something that's being said in the lyrics you know and um and something that we believe in wholeheartedly we wouldn't be you know we play this music because we love it we love that beat I, me tired all you know make all of us we love that hardcore beat, the old beat, and it's uh, like an ancient beat, I mean, from foundation. It's a heartbeat, and it's just something to rock over that beat. I can't explain how good it feels to rock vocals or, you know, over that beat or rock instruments. You guys probably play and all that stuff, maybe, and yeah, you probably know what I'm talking about. singers, yeah. That yeah. beat is... We're both singers, yeah, actually, okay. <laughs> Okay, cool. So you guys know that beat is just great, man. So it's just something that that I've been wanting to do for a while to bring that hardcore beat back. That boop, 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 you know, I just bring that style back with the rhythmic bass guitar. And, you, know, like and you get the audience you get the audience into it again like how the live shows like from you know I shared some of your videos today and um, you know the first response is like man what a fucking killer live band is what I keep hearing so I guess the, the well, shows are going good well, thanks, man. Yeah, that's another thing we're trying to do. Be, you know, give that spirit again, give that soul, you know. Uh, Jim Morrison said, break on through the other side, you know. <laughs> Try you to know set the man on fire. <laughs> Wait, that was in Val Kilmer? Yeah, man. <laughs> that was got to, got to. <laughs> you, you know what's cool, Israel, is like the two guys you're talking to, we do a bunch of podcasts, and we have this conversation where Sam – didn't grow up in hardcore. Oh, yeah, and yeah, definitely not. I did. <laughs> and when you take a band like Fireburn, you have two different perspectives on it. And I was like, okay, I'll check it out. And I was like, not only is it a good hardcore band, it's got style, which sometimes Every hardcore bands lack. And Sam told me four or five times within like two days like how great fireburn was and i was like i got i got it dude because he didn't he didn't grow up in it great. and he was like this is great like objectively this is a great record and That's he was like 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 digging back like like trying to tell me i'm like no i know so i have you have like the <laughs> jaded guy like me and a guy who 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 didn't grow up in it sort of like come together and um you know in our research on you and going back, we have these discussions about you and your music 
Bad Brains, wow. Fireburn, and all that stuff. And, and when we get to Fireburn, we like just sort of met at this point. We're like, this is objectively great. And then we were looking at um, I, it must have been one of your first shows. It was in Tompkins Square Park, right? Oh, the yeah. the rabies. Yes. Yeah, and it's like the third. That was the third show. Okay. Like you said, Jim Morrison, and try and set the <laughs> night on fire. It's like it's there's great. a there's a spirit of hardcore that gets things going, and I I sort of see that with your band, and it's you and it's Todd Youth and your members and the spirit of Bad Brains, but you know, absolutely great. your own thing. Like brought yeah, us to this point, uh, where I was like, yeah, I want to talk about Bad Brains and all that, but. It, Want to talk about fire? Yeah, we want to we want to put the spotlight on on Fireburn because that's what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, killer. I, I I looked to a lot as as a kid. I was impressed by a lot of front men, you know. And uh, hardcore didn't come into my life till later on, till I was like 17, maybe. So before 17, all I knew was uh, the front men of rock and stuff like that, you know, or the front men of the, the older bands from the sixties and stuff, you know, uh, or what was going on in the eighties that was available to me. Uh, a lot of that stuff was, uh, performance oriented. If you know what I mean, you know, those guys, they gave the show. Um, when I got to hardcore, I saw the beauty of, of stripping it down to, to what, it, what hardcore is. I saw, the need for that. And then I saw the bad brains and I saw it put together. I saw both. I saw HR give a show yet strip it down. And right. I said, wow, that guy's got it. Look at it right there. He's performing. He's giving it all. But then he's not really like, he's not cock rocking, you know, he's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's hardcore. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. It's like, uh, you know, you know, uh, Johnny Rotten did that too. So a lot of bands, you know, right. if you go back, you know, you got to go back. Like Iggy Pop, and you go back to before Iggy Pop was Jim Morrison, you know, and uh, so on and so on. So you get you get like uh, these singers that are sort of proto punk, like Jim Morrison. He's like proto punk, you know, like yeah, before that's punk. a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, like punk was just like opening its eyes, you know. And like so, like you get like then the EP pop that follows him, and then you get like you know the British invasion that are taking the American sound and their British sound and producing the Sex Pistols and other bands, the like or other bands over there. And then you get America putting out the Dead Boys, and it's just it's just rock and roll, really. To me, punk rock is rock and roll uh, sped up faster and faster. You know, if we were to play. Um, suspect in 1960s with uh opening for little richard i'm sure there'd be some people that would get that shit you know they'd be like yeah i understand that you know it's just fast and um uh that's what i think rock and roll uh uh, punk rock is because you know a lot of times see the bad brains explained to me they said man we didn't you know this is important like daryl jennifer told me he said man we didn't write hardcore He's like, we didn't set out to write at 100 miles an hour. He was like, that happened over time and get to this. It happened over time to them that they had to speed up their set because they believed, now get to this, they had PMA. They believed in so many of their songs that they, 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 they were heartbroken almost to cut them out of the set. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? So, so like, spe- you know, in order to cover all their songs, what's the necessary thing? You have Make to play it faster. faster. That is, because that's you amazing. you only have half, a, half an hour. That just blew so my mind. Play, <laughs> if you yeah, if you play Pay to Come the way it was originally written, which was, um, I make decisions with precision, got the side to make a legend, get to see the what the bees perfectly my fan of dan and da 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 you never get through to the end. But if you play it I if you play it like that, then you're gonna finish the song faster. And you play the next one fast. You play the next one and that's something they got from James Brown. Because James Brown wouldn't come up on stage and go, um, get up, get on up, 
get up, get on up, like a sex machine. Get when he say him live, he's like, get up, get on up, get up, get on up, like a sex machine. Get right, it was always up. faster. Yeah. It was all fast. And that's something they got from funk bands, because that's what you had to do. You got a lot of hit songs. You got to play all them songs. You only got a half hour. When I first saw the Ramones, so they, that's what they did. Like I was like, holy shit, right. these guys are way faster live. I was like, one, two, three, four. And that was it. Then they would play. Yeah. Know? But it, it's, yeah. that's amazing to me. Bad Brains played so fast. They created a genre of music just like out of like the economics of a half an hour set. <laughs> like... All right, we're going to do 15 yeah. songs. Like, we're not cutting Band in D.C. out of the set, so we yeah. got to play it fast, that's all. <laughs> there you go. And mm-hmm. now you understand, like, how this music really came about because, you know, they are, they wrote the blueprint for this stuff, really. And and our attitude and, and uh, Rock for Light, um, you know, inspired bands like Black Flag, Minor Threat. Everyone. And stuff like Everybody. So they they really laid the blueprints down. So knowing how that happened is really crucial because uh, hardcore is truly a spirit. It's a spirit of don't stop me. It's a spirit of I'm going to fight. It's a spirit of we're going to do it if, no matter what it takes. And that's what you hear when you listen to the Bad Brains because they were going to do it. You're going to you're going to hear these songs if we have to play them a hundred miles an hour. You're going to hear these songs. And this is what the spirit of punk is. This is why bands like Minor Threat and these bands. This is why they were fist up, you know, because it's a PMA. You can't stop me attitude. And I am a I'm a kid, and I got songs, and I don't care if I have a record label. I don't care if I have a a, a hundred thousand dollar set uh, that stage lights and all that. I am going to give you a show like you've never seen before, and I believe in myself. And this is, and and we can't afford those things, and we can't have the major labels come look at us and nobody wants to hear us but you know what we're still going to play this music as hard and as fast and as spiritual as we can and give you a good show and that's that's really what what it all comes down to then you know the philosophies come in what are you what do you think about straight edge or all that stuff but realistically it's just the spirit of survival it's like we got to survive we got to play these songs and um and, if, and, you know, of course, they love playing their music. So, you know, as they saw the audience going crazier for playing it fast, it was just a natural progression, you know. So um, that's an interesting thing to, to learn about the brains. And it, so when it, I, when I, you know, when I, when I joined them, it was like, this is an ancient beat. This is a beat we want to preserve. This is something that, you know, bad brains need to live. They can't just go away. <laughs> and it, so, I think know. it you you kind of boil down something really important about punk rock and hardcore, which is true, which is you know whether you like it or not, whether you want to hear it or not, you're gonna hear it. We're gonna play it louder than you want. We're gonna play it faster than you want, but you're gonna hear it. You may not even like it, but you're gonna hear it. And Bad Brains like just you know embodies that whole thing and sort of shoved it down your throat. But luckily. The music was fantastic. <laughs> was good so enough had... for that. Yeah. yeah. Because a lot of bands tried it, but didn't, you know, they tried and they died. You know, a lot of bands right. tried that, but couldn't make it. But you listen to those songs, you put on Attitude or you put on uh, Rock for Life, and you really listen to the guitar, uh, the, listen to the bass, the effort it takes to play those songs is amazing the lines that he came up with daryl wrote a lot of that stuff as far as i understand and the lines that he he's coming up with on that album the the, the idea of inventing they not only invented hardcore they invented the breakdown the new york hardcore breakdown was invented, invented no, who, by Bad Brains. I think I think it was who did that before them. I had never when I heard that breakdown, I was like, What is going on? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> that the the shit. mosh part, quote unquote. Yeah. It was invented by guys from D C with the Bad Brains. Yeah, man. And so it's like you know, like it I mean their music I'm so glad that they decided to play fast 
and to squeeze their songs in cause, and that they had belief in their songs because we probably would have never had the joy of hearing Attitude had they not learned how to play that fast. Yeah. You don't want me anymore. And then I walk right out the door. That never would have happened for us. You know, like, it would have been some old punk rock band playing at half beat, you know. Do you want me anymore? I love that the way you put it. That it, it comes out of necessity. <laughs> it didn't even come out of, like, let's try and be crazy. You know, we'll play faster. Like Slayer wanted to play faster, you know, but everyone's like, you're the way you're explaining is like necessity. And that's an interesting yeah. perspective. That, yeah. And it makes it real. Well, that's Daryl out of Daryl's mouth, Daryl's own mouth sitting on the couch telling me about their group. You know, we, he spent a lot of year, a lot of time, a lot of weeks and months talking to me about reminiscing, you know, was, I guess it was the first time he had had a chance to reminisce in a long time. And right. He reminisced with me a lot, a lot, a lot of, a lot. He was like, let me tell you, it's real. <laughs> you know, like, it's real. You don't know how the bad brains start playing fast. I didn't mean to start playing fast. You know, like that. You know, just talk to me. He said, let me tell you how that started, boy. <laughs> 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 That's great. He said, we used to play slow, Israel. <laughs> That's why I used the example of uh, pay to come, because he said, you used to play slow, Israel. You didn't play that. You used to play like punk beat. He said, uh, everybody was playing punk beats. He said, the only way, you know, I have our set. And uh, he said it was a combination of one to, one, you know, one to get all the songs in, and then, then it turned out to be standing out. So it was a combination of standing out, too. And so he said it just, that's the way it was. That's what happened. You know, that's why we got it. <laughs> awesome. Never know, man. Look, they say the Lord works in mysterious ways, but it's whatever, you know, the creation, this this thing that we're living in, this uh, might be a computer program, some said, who knows, but this thing we're living in works in mysterious ways, man. It's a weird, weird thing happening. Spoken well, like a true believer, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, the... What we want to do is uh, to bring this to a close. You've given us generous amounts of time, and really glad we got to so many of the great things that we've gotten to. What we do is because the name of the podcast is "If I Rule the World," we pose this to our guests. We pose this to the people we interview. The question is: If you rule the world, Israel, what would that look like? Mm. Stumped. Wow. It's a tough one. Well, if I rule the world, I would I would tell people that I don't rule of myself, but I rule of a a spirit of, of mankind that dwells in all of us that, that's called empathy and compassion. And then that spirit must emanate from the universe because the universe is living. It's full of life. It's 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 it, it caused us to live. So it must be about life. Sure it's about death, but in death there's always replacement of something else. When a fire burns, it burns down everything, but then the new shrubs grow up and the greenery is something that the animals can live off of. Everybody can feed off because these new shoots grow out of the burnt ground. So I would say I represent something higher than myself, right? And I represent life and that thing is a is a conscious thing. But then I would then take that and say, let's actualize life. Let's put that into an actual, uh, 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 an actual uh, uh, way of, of, of living on this planet, which means, of course, uh, the, the key word, empathy, or like you said, compassion. Feeding your fellow man, all right? Giving food, making sure people aren't hungry, making sure people have a place uh, in, in, in some people call it socialism, but there is no way they're not going to be acting in a Christian manner. Jesus was a socialist. He hung out with riffraffs. He talked about loving each other. He talked about providing food, and so was Jehovah in the old Bible was a socialist. He talked about clothing the naked, feeding the poor, giving a certain percentage of your money to the poor, not collecting all the food on your land, leaving 10% for the poor to collect, uh, making sure there was no homeless, taking care of the widow, the fatherless. These are people would call this, this stuff socialism. So be it. That's what I would do. I would pursue money from the wealthiest to say, look, you are wealthy. You are, 
You are the one percent. You own more money than the bottom fifty percent of the entire planet. Because you know, Not- I don't want to. I don't want to go on too far, much further, but I mean, I'm talking social issues, you know, man. You know, it's all it's all in there, man. If I rule the world, I would make sure that every, you know, I'd feed, uh, as the song by Nas says, if I rule the world, I'd feed all my sons. That's that, all my that, daughters. That's our intro. That's by our the way. intro. And, you know, love them, love them, right, baby. So there, there we go, man. That that song says it all. Nas Nas put the rap down real well on that song. So that's that's basically me too. I, so I'm, if you I'm rule the world. The Love him, love him, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a lot of love, man. It'd just, just be like, yo, be no black and white, be none of that garbage. It'll just be like, yo, are, you know, cool people chilling out, having a good time, getting to know each other as human beings. Me and Todd, we don't look at each other as black and white. We're just human, two human cats that have such a great time together. And I wish the whole world would experience that. And I wish that Donald Trump would stop saying what he is saying in public and dividing people by telling people all this stuff about other people are bad and some people are good. That is not the way to lead. You are dividing people when you tell people some people are bad, some people are good. You got to tell them we're all in this together and we got to rise together. And the only way we're going to make it is together. United we stand, divided we what? Fall. Right? I don't there know. There it is. All right, yeah. Now I got it right. Divided we stand, divided we fall. <laughs> uh, yeah, in the words of Bad Brains, I'm not a nationalist. I don't trust politics. And that's how go. I feel about... There we go. In the, in the words of, in, in the words of uh, Queensryche, is there anybody listening? Israel, that uh, from the young kid uh, growing up in Westbury till today, man, like you're, uh, you stayed creative, you know, the fact that you're you're still putting out music that's... As good as you, as good as it is in 2018, just speaks of of the type of person that you are. Super creative, like compassionate. Uh, just want to say thank you for for taking a, a really good amount of time to talk to us all the way from Cali. Thank you, thank you for having me. It was such a great um, honor talking to you guys. It was a really comfortable time and um it's easy to be candid and real and comfortable and cool when you guys are as cool as you are so thank you so much man this is great yeah i mean i I, i'll put it to you the way i heard it israel is saying wake up rise up listen up and check out the new fire burn and you know we've we've been accustomed to uh um acquainted with your past and what you're doing now and your future I can say from the bottom of my heart, it's it's an honor and a pleasure talking to you, my friend. You too, brother. You too, brothers. All right. right here, you too, brothers. We're, you know, one family, and we can't do it without each other, man. So thank you all for, for calling me and for talking to me and for being interested in what, uh, you know, what's going on with the whole thing we spoke about today, and I hope that it does some good um, for people and people get to understand a little bit more about our music that we enjoy listening to and playing, uh, all of us, I mean, all three of us, and uh, a little bit about Rastafari and a little bit more about that and, you know, it's a little bit more about everything, man, and, and thanks so much for, again, for uh, for listening to Fireburn. We're, we want to say one thing to people, I'm, I'm thankful. Thank you for, for listening to Fireburn. That, that's, you know, thank you. Thank you for listening to it. Awesome. Awesome, thanks. Look, looking forward to meeting you in the future and uh, I guess, yeah, I guess that's about it.